Um, hello everyone. Welcome to this welcome to this Monash Cybersecurity Seminar. Today we are welcoming Russell Lai, who is a PhD candidate at Friedrich Alexander University in Germany. Uh, his research interests are mainly uh, in sussing argument systems, anonymous systems, homomorphic cryptography, and password-based cryptography. Uh, he also works on source coding theory, a branch of information theory. And today he will talk to us about subtractive sets over cyclotomic rings, and in particular limits of Schnorr-like arguments over lattices. So thank you, Russell, for your talk. And the scene is yours. Okay, thank you for the introduction. And so can you see my screen? Yep, all good. Okay, so yeah, let me start. So right, so as uh, Mohammed said, uh, I will talk about subtractive sets over cyclotomic rings. And this is a joint work with uh, Martin Albrecht and it will appear in crypto. So, okay, so to, to give you some perspective, this talk will be about these mathematical structures that we define for subtractive sets and they are motivated by lattice-based uh, constructions of lattice-based Schnorr-like arguments. Um, but I won't go very deep into the theory of, of uh, these arguments. And if you want to know more, I uh, encourage you to check out these concurrent works on lattice-based Schnorr-like arguments, which are also appearing in crypto. Okay, so, uh, so let us begin with this slide that every other lattice talk needs, and the other being the LWE slide. So, so here I have the SI slide. And so we consider the SIS problem or the short integer solution problem. Uh, so, so here we are given some uh, modulus Q and norm bound beta. And then uh, after fixing this, a problem statement of SIS is, consists of a matrix A and a vector Y. And the problem is to find some short vector X satisfying A times X equals Y modulo Q and the norm of X should be bound by beta. So in many cases, uh, people consider the SIS problem over the ring of rational integers, Z, but uh, this time we are considering the more general setting uh, of the SIS problem over some ring R. And to recall a ring R is just a mathematical structure where you can do addition, subtraction, and multiplication like uh, as usual, but not always division. So for example, um, in the ring of rational integers, you cannot always divide two integers and get another integer. Okay, so our motivating problem uh, for this work is to, instead of proving knowledge of an SIS witness X, so this X here. And to be more precise, let me define this uh, relation, which is parametrized by uh, an additional uh, element S and a ring element S. Uh, the norm bound beta and maybe I should also put Q here. So it's parametrized by S beta and Q. So again, the problem statement is uh, given by A and Y and we say that X satisfies the statement A Y with slack S if it, uh, if it satisfies A times X equals to S times Y module Q and the norm of X is bounded by beta. So this element S here is called the slack and it measures uh, the kind of the quality of the solution X. So if S equals one, then this uh, equation is satisfied. Uh, this SIS relation is satisfied, satisfied exactly. And we say that uh, X satisfies the relation with no slack. Uh, otherwise we say that it satisfies the relation with some slack S. So in general, a protocol or an argument uh, system for proving an SIS relation goes as follows. So we have the prover on the left hand side, which inputs the statement AY and the witness X. And on the right hand side, we have the verifier, which inputs the statement AY. So they will interact for several rounds, for some rounds, and then eventually the verifier would output um, a bit B deciding or not whether it thinks that uh, the prover has a valid witness X for the statement AY. Okay, so an argument system should satisfy a few properties. And um, in this work, we will focus on 
completeness and soundness. So for completeness, we say that the argument is complete for the relation R1 beta with no slack. If whenever the prover has a witness X that satisfies AY with no slack, then the verifier accepts with uh, certainty. So it always outputs one. And we say that the argument system has kappa knowledge soundness, where this kappa is called the knowledge error. Uh, so knowledge soundness for this relation are S beta prime. If there exists an, a knowledge extractor, which uh, so that the following happens. So we say if there is a prover P that convinces V to accept uh, a statement AY that is to output one with a certain probability rho that is greater than kappa, then my extractor E, when given access, uh, oracle access to the prover, it should extract a, a witness X tilde with probability rho minus kappa, which is positive such that it satisfies uh, the statement AY with slack S. Okay, so notice that uh, the relation for completeness and the relation for soundness uh, uh, are different, so, right? So mainly uh, this S might not be one and this beta prime might not be beta. So there is a gap be between uh, like what the prover, what the prover needs uh, at to, to run the argument and uh, and what the verifier is convinced about. And this is known as the soundness gap in uh, lattice-based argument systems. Okay, so so then with, uh, with with this background, a challenge in a challenge in designing uh, argument systems for the SIS relation or, or lattice-based arguments is that we want to design these systems so that we can minimize uh, the knowledge error kappa and at the same time also this slack S. So of course one would also want to minimize the difference between beta prime and beta, um, which we call the stretch in this work, but uh, I won't go into details about this uh, in this talk. Okay, so uh, let us look at uh, the landscape of um, uh, argument systems for the SI simulation. Uh, before 2000, before the year 2019, there were uh, mainly three types of argument systems for the SI simulation. The first is uh, the first kind is based on PCP, which is uh, known, uh, which stands for probabilistically checkable proofs. So for this kind of system, uh, one would first express the SI relation. Uh, uh, as a statement of another NP-complete language. So in, in, for example, the R1CS. And then one would pick a PCP that is uh, native for this uh, NP-complete language and then compile it into an argument system using some kind of commitment schemes. So usually these kind, this kind of uh, systems produce logarithmic size proofs. So they, they, are, they are pretty short and they can do so without slack and without stretch. So that's nice. But then they also suffer from having, from requiring super polynomial modulus uh, cube for, for achieving negligible soundness error. Okay, and then we have the second type called the Stern-like systems. These are combinatorial systems based on the cut and choose technique. And like the PCP-based systems, they can uh, prove the SI isolation without slack and without stretch, but they uh, have the downside of producing linear size proofs and can only achieve uh, constant knowledge error. That means uh, lambda repetitions is needed uh, to achieve negligible soundness error in lambda, where lambda in this case is the security parameter. And then finally, we have Schnorr-like systems, and these are algebraic systems that can achieve inverse polynomial knowledge error, and therefore only uh, lambda over log lambda repetitions are needed. And in practice, that, that's quite a big difference from uh, the Stern-like systems. And moreover, 
these snow-like systems, they are linear in a sense, and this linearity can be exploited to perform recursive composition uh, using this bulletproof uh, folding technique. And this results in logarithmic size proofs. But uh, the drawback of snow-like systems is that they suffer from having some slack and some stretch, which are like both not equal to one. And, and these are significant because they will be, uh, these are significant in particular uh, when you want to perform recursive composition because they get amplified um, exponentially. Okay, so then uh, a recent development after 2019 is that people try to combine uh, Stern-like and Snow-like protocols so, so as to get the best of both worlds. And they achieve, they, they successfully get uh, protocols with uh, inverse polynomial knowledge error and it uh, without any slack and without any stretch. But then uh, this is done by adding extra nonlinear constraints to, uh, ex to, to existing Schnorr-like systems. And this nonlinear constraints breaks the linearity of uh, Schnorr-like systems, which, it, which uh, is needed for the bulletproof, fro bulletproof folding technique. And therefore, it is unclear how we can turn these uh, more modern systems, uh, uh, so, so how, how we can modify them to produce uh, logarithmic size proofs. So then there's, uh, it comes the natural question uh, whether we can keep the linearity and the inverse polynomial knowledge error of Schnorr uh, so that we can perform bulletproof folding and get logarithmic size proofs, but at the same time reduce the slack and the stretch. So using some other techniques rather than uh, introducing nonlinear non constraints. Okay, so to answer this question, let us look at, uh, at two examples of Schnorr-like protocols. And so this first protocol is just the lattice analog of the textbook uh, Schnorr protocol. So here to recall, we have the prover and the verifier. The prover inputs the statement AY and the witness X while the verifier inputs AY. And to start, the prover samples some short vector u and computes a times u as v, send v over. And then the verifier would choose some challenge c from this challenge set, big C. And then finally, the prover returns uh, u plus x, c times x, and the verifier checks that this relation holds. Okay, but the, the detail of the protocol is not important. And one point to note is that the knowledge error of this protocol is inversely proportional to the size of this challenge set, big C. So if we have a polynomial size uh, challenge set C, then we can get an inverse polynomial knowledge error. Okay, so next let us look at how knowledge, knowledge extraction work in, uh, in this, for this protocol. So recall that we have this verification equation here ignoring the norm bound uh, uh, condition. So the usual extraction strategy is that is to run the prover twice on different challenges, C0 and C1, until we get two accepting transcripts, which contains um, the, the value V and two X hats, X hat zero, X hat one, so that these three, val these three values, they satisfy uh, the combined verification equation written in this matrix form. And the next step for the extractor is to try to solve this following system of linear equations uh, for some vector z. And I call this a dual Vandermonde system because this uh, system of linear equation, linear equations is defined by the transpose of a Vandermonde matrix P. Okay, so suppose that the extractor is successful in computing this Z, then it can uh, like apply Z to the uh, transcripts given by the, the, the prover and then produce an extracted witness uh, X tutor as, and, and as follows. So that it satisfies this, uh, this relation, this SIS relation, okay? 
So then let us look at the second example, which is the bulletproof, uh, lattice bulletproof protocol, which was published uh, in last year's crypto. So uh, in this protocol, we need to make an extra uh, structural assumption about the problem statement that the, the matrix A can be split into two parts, A0 and A1 of equal dimensions. And similarly, the witness X can be split into two parts of equal dimensions, X0 and X1. And with this, we can write uh, Y, which is equal to AX as um, A0 times X0 plus A1 times X1, right? Just by simple arithmetic. And then in the actual protocol itself, instead of sampling a vector U and then compute V, the prover would compute these cross terms, A0 times X1 and A1 times X0, send them over and then it's the same story as before. So the verifier samples a challenge and the prover returns uh, uh, this linear combination of the witness component. So we notice that this relation that the verifier checks here is nothing but yet another SIS relation uh, where the witness X hat here is uh, has a dimension that is half that of the original X. So if we recursively compose this protocol a logarithmic number of times, we can shrink this X hat, sorry, we can shrink this X hat uh, down to constant dimensions and then get a logarithmic size, uh, uh, logarithmic communication protocol or logarithmic size proof, okay? And as before, the knowledge error of this protocol is again inversely proportional to the size of the challenge set. So that's why we really want to uh, have a large challenge set, say a polynomial size challenge set. So, and finally, let us look at uh, also at the knowledge extractor of the that is bulletproof. And so let us recall this verification equation. And so this time the extractor would run the prover not two times, but three times to obtain uh, on, on three different uh, challenges, C0, C1, and C2, to obtain three different uh, accepting transcripts that satisfy this combined verification equation again. And then this time the extractor is going to solve a dual Vandermon system of three dimension uh, for this vector Z. And then again, if it is successful, it would uh, apply Z to the transcript and obtain the extracted witness X tilde. So you might have already uh, spotted the pattern here that the verifier is always, sorry, the knowledge extractor is always going to solve uh, some t-dimensional uh, dual Vandermont system for this vector Z. And then if it is successful, it can obtain some kind of extracted witness. So it is natural to ask then, uh, for what challenges C0 to CT minus one and slack S is the following dual Vandermont system solvable over this ring R. And right, so we observe that if this condition is satisfied, then, uh, then, the, then the system is solvable. And this condition says that for any CI uh, among the challenges, if this product of differences between CI and CJ, where J runs through, uh, where the CJs runs through all the, uh, so all possible C, all possible challenges except for CI. If this product divides the slack S for all CI, then this dual Vandermont system is solvable over the ring R. Okay, so with this observation, uh, we are motivated to define the central notion of this work that is ST subtractive set. So if we, so we say that a set C, uh, which is a subset of R, is ST subtractive if for any T subset, big T consisting of these challenges, C0 up to CT minus one, it holds, so this uh, divisibility condition holds. Okay, so if this, Divisibility condition holds for any uh, T subset big T, we say that uh, this set C is X 
as t subtractive. And furthermore, if the slack s is just one, so there is no slack, then we simply say that uh, c is subtractive. So at this point, I would like to uh, uh, say a few things about secret sharing, which is uh, seems to be irrelevant uh, to the context of uh, for argument systems, but indeed there, there is a relation. So we notice that if C is an ST subtractive set, then for any subset T uh, of C, not only is the dual Venomon system uh, solvable over R, uh, so the Venomon system defined by big T, but also the primal Venomon system as well. So the system right here, where we notice that this Venomon matrix uh, uh, has the correct orientation instead of the transport, transpose one uh, presented in the previous slide. And we notice that this is exactly the, the, the system of relations that we need to uh, solve when computing polynomial interpolation, which is a central operation in T out of N secret sharing or in Shamir secret sharing uh, specifically. So therefore, if we have uh, it, an ST subtractive set C, then we can use it as the set of evaluation points and uh, for, for a Shamir secret sharing scheme. So that way we get T out of N secret sharing over the ring R. Okay, so that's uh, basically what I wanted to say about secret sharing in this talk. And so to summarize, we have these uh, sample implications. So for example, if we have an S3, subtractive set where, where t equals three of some size n, then we can obtain lattice bulletproof with slack s and knowledge error two over n. And as I just mentioned in the previous slide, if we have an st subtractive set of size n, then we can have, uh, we can build t out of n secret sharing and, and then we can further use this to build lattice space t out of n threshold primitives. Okay, so by now, uh, hopefully I've, I have convinced you that um, ST subtractive sets are sort of important. And so th and then the challenge is to find large uh, ST subtractive sets. And by large, I mean polynomial size with some small slack S over some interesting ring R. And in lattice space crypto, uh, a very popular choice of R is, uh, is an is a cyclotomic ring. And a cyclotomic ring is just the ring of rational integer adjoined with some primitive m fruit of unity. So this is some complex number so that uh, uh, the mth power of, of theta is equal to one. And m is the smallest uh, power uh, that does this. Okay, and we consider m to be a polynomial, uh, polynomial size parameter. So over these uh, cyclotomic rings, we have the, 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 the following results. Uh, can I ask so a question before you move on to yes. the slide? Okay. Uh, could you go back to the previous slide? Mm -hmm. So you said that large here means polysized. Is this because yes. this is the best that you can achieve or because wouldn't you uh, like yes. it to be Indeed. exponentially large? Yeah, it would be amazing to have exponential size uh, subtractive sets, but as I will show in the next slide, uh, this is impossible. Oh, okay, thanks. Uh, well, impossible for small slack. So if you if you can tolerate very large slack, then yes, but uh, but usually you don't. Okay. Okay. So right. So let me let me summarize our results about um, subtractive sets. So we give both positive and, and almost matching negative results. So first, over power of two cyclotomic rings, that is when the order of the cyclotomic ring M is a power of two, two to the L. Then for the positive result, we can we construct a family of ST subtractive sets of size N for a wide variety of ST and N. And among them is, uh, among them, we have a two free subtractive set of size m over two plus one. And that would give us a bulletproof with slack two. 
and so and arguably two is like the next best thing that you can get uh, other than one and so correspondingly we have the following uh, negative result which says that it is impossible to construct a family of 2t subtractive sets uh, where this family is parametrized by m such that the mth set of this family is of size strictly greater than m plus one it is impossible to do that okay then moving on to uh, prime power cyclotomic rings that is when m is uh, equal to p to the l a power of a, of a prime p then on the positive side we can construct a family of subtractive sets of size p and note that here I say subtractive, that means uh, there is no slack with these uh, sets. And, and with these sets, we can uh, have bulletproof without any slack. And on the negative side, we, we show that it's impossible to construct a subtractive set of size strictly greater than P. So our uh, positive result is actually optimal in this setting. And if we apply um, if we instantiate the existing lattice bulletproof protocol with our new subtractive set, then we can get uh, lattice bulletproofs with better parameters, as, sh as shown in these um, tables here. So, but I must note that uh, part of this improvement is due to the new subtractive set, but uh, another part, mainly the, the stretch part, is due to just more careful analysis. So. I think uh, if they had uh, if they had a, a better, a more careful analysis, they could achieve something similar, uh, but but with a bigger slack. Okay, so in the context of uh, lattice-based Schnorr-like arguments, we also show that unless fundamentally new techniques are known, like uh, so, mainly about constructing the extractor. Uh, then it is impossible to have both very small slack and very small knowledge error, a uh, very small knowledge error. So there is a trade-off going on between slack and knowledge error. And finally, we also demonstrate how we can apply ST subtractive sets to uh, threshold secret sharing and hence also to uh, the constructions of threshold primitives. And as an, as an example, we show a construction of distributed pseudo-random function in our paper. Okay, so uh, before I move on to the technical parts, are there any qu further questions? There is no in the chat. Okay, okay yeah, I think I'm on time. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, okay, so next I will move on to uh, the more technical part of this talk. And so our results in this paper uh, critically rely on the presence and absence of ideals in the ring R, and therefore I should tell you something about uh, ideals. So to recall, if, if I have an element C of the ring R, then the ideal generated by C is the set uh, of elements that can be written as C times some, uh, some R where R is a ring element. Or another way to say this is that the ideal generated by C contains all ring elements that is divisible by C. Extending, extending this, uh, this notion, we can say that the ideal generated by a set of ring elements T is the set of ring elements that can be written as a linear combination of the elements in T, where the coefficients are ring elements themselves. Okay, so under this uh, language, we can redefine our ST subtractive set in this uh, slightly more elegant uh, way. So we say that a, a set C is ST subtractive if for any uh, T subset big T of C and for any element C of T, we have that the slack S belongs to the ideal generated by the product of differences between C and C prime, where C prime runs through all the elements of T except for C. Okay, so 
uh, let's keep this definition in mind and ask ourselves, um, how hard is it to construct large ST subtractive sets for small S, for a small slack S? And if you think about it uh, with different rings, you notice that, uh, okay, so sorry, I'm, I was too fast. So, okay, so to construct a large ST subtractive set uh, basically means we want a lot of elements to divide uh, this slack S. And if you think about it over different rings, then you find that if I simply pick the ring of rational integer Z, then it is going to be difficult because um, let's say my slack is exactly one, so we, I don't want any slack. Uh, then it is difficult because the only invertible elements in Z are just negative one and one. And there, so your, your subtractive set is going to be very small. And even if I increase the slack a little bit to two, then we notice that the only factors of two are negative two, negative one, one, and two. So there are only a handful of elements that divide uh, these small slacks. And therefore, over the, the usual ring of rational integers, it is going to be difficult. But in the case of uh, psychotomic rings, which are sort of natural extensions of the rational uh, ring of rational integers, then things are a little bit different. So for example, in power of two psychotomic rings, we notice that whenever, so for, for any integer k, uh, whenever the order of the psychotomic ring does not divide k, then we have that the element two is divisible by one minus theta to the k. So th there will be a lot of elements that divide uh, two, which is somewhat counterintuitive. And similarly in prime power cyclotomic rings, we notice that this element here, one minus theta to the k over one minus theta is invertible whenever uh, p and k are co-prime. So over these rings, there are a lot of invertible elements in contrast to the, the ring of rational integers where there are only two invertible elements. So that is to say it would be a lot easier to construct ST subtractive sets over the psychotomic rings uh, rather than the uh, ring of rational integers. Okay, so with this uh, background and intuition in mind, uh, let us, uh, so let me, let me show you some special cases of uh, our results. And let's tackle the case of prime power cyclotomic rings first uh, because it's easier. So, okay, so over these prime power cyclotomic rings, we have the following positive result. We say that, we simply say that this following set is subtractive and this set is of size exactly P. And my set C here consists of the elements mu zero, mu one up to mu P minus one, where mu K is this element that I show, uh, that I showed on the previous slide. That's one minus theta to the k over one minus theta. And recall that uh, subtractive means, being subtractive, it means that uh, the differences between any two elements of uh, the set C uh, should be invertible. So the proof of this is very simple. First, we notice that this element mu k is invertible over R whenever P and K are co-prime, as I mentioned on the previous slide. And then we consider, we, we note that for any distinct i and j, the difference between mu j and mu i can be written as theta to the i times mu j minus i. And theta to the i is invertible and mu j minus y j minus i is invertible and well-defined because j and i are distinct and then j is greater than i. And therefore this whole thing is also invertible and that concludes the proof. So on the negative side, we show that there is no subtractive set of size greater than p. And this kind of also answers um, uh, Muhammad's question that uh, we cannot have exponential size subtractive set because usually we want p to be polynomial, right? Then we hopefully, hopefully p is polynomial size. Otherwise you can't even write down a ring element. 
Okay, so uh, right, so we say that there is no subtractive set C of size strictly greater than P. And to show this, we first notice that the ideal generated by one minus theta, which we call I, has exactly P cosets. And uh, the element one is not in this ideal. So then suppose C is the subtractive set of size strictly greater than P. Then by the pigeonhole principle, I'm, I must be able to find two elements, C0, C1, that are distinct in, our, in, in my set C so that they belong to the same coset of I. And that is, to, that is to say, the difference between C0 and C1 must belong to this idea. But then since C is subtractive, the difference between C0 and C1 must be invertible. And that means one is in the ideal, which is a contradiction. Okay, so far so good. Then let's uh, move to the power of two case. And in the power of two case, I would like to show you this very complicated theorem, but uh, since there are a lot of variables to digest, let me just uh, show you this special case, which says that uh, C is a two free subtractive set. So this following set here is two free subtractive and it is of size uh, Euler phi of M plus one, which is equal to M over two plus one. Okay, and my set C consists of zero, one, theta, theta squared, all the way up to theta to the power of five M minus one. Okay, so, so to show this, first we notice that we can ignore this zero because all the other elements are invertible by themselves and therefore their differences with zero is also uh, invertible. So we can ignore the zero is for free. And next, without loss of generality, we can consider uh, a subset T of C that can be written uh, in the form theta to the A, theta to the B, and theta to the C, where uh, A is smaller than B, smaller than C. So for this set T, uh, we want to show that the element two, the slack two, because we are considering two free subtractive sets. So we want to show that this slack two is in the ideal generated by this product here. So the product of theta to the a minus theta to the b times theta to the a minus theta to the c. And let's call this ideal i for, uh, for conciseness. So to show this, we first notice that uh, theta to the a is invertible and therefore we can divide it from uh, the two factors here and therefore show that i is also, i can be written as um, the ideal generated by one minus theta to the B minus A times one minus theta to the C minus A. And then after some routine calculation, which I cannot show on this slide, uh, we notice that we can take out the even part of B minus A and C minus A out to uh, uh, in the exponent. So that I is equal to the ideal generated uh, by one minus theta to the power of even part of B minus A plus even part of C minus A. And by even part of B minus A, I mean that, uh, I mean the greatest power of two that divides uh, B minus A. So after this, first we notice that two is inside this ideal, one minus theta to the power phi of M. And then the sum of the two even parts of B minus A and C minus A is at most phi of M. And therefore we can conclude that this ideal is a subset of the ideal that uh, we are interested in. And then as a conclusion, we conclude that uh, two is in uh, our ideal of interest, I. Okay, and for more details, you can uh, look at the blog post that I will show later, or maybe the, the paper also. Right, and then finally on the negative side, we show that there is no family of two T subtractive set 
parameterized by m so that the mth set is of size greater than m plus one. And so to, to prove this, it suffices to show, to find one m, one such m, so that the mth uh, set of this family cannot be of size greater than m plus one. So towards finding these m's, uh, we consider the powers, uh, those m's being a power of two greater than four, and m plus one is a prime. So uh, curiously, these primes uh, have a special name called Fermat primes. And as of now, we only know uh, five examples, one being free and the other four being, so, so the, the one being free, we do not consider because it is smaller than four. But for the other four, we have 5, 17, 257, and 6, 5, 5, 3, 7. And these, these are the only known Fermat primes, curiously. So for these Fermat primes, we can, we can pick any of them. And then we can consider any factor ideal, i, of the ideal generated by m plus 1. And we notice that this ideal i has exactly m plus 1 cosets. And two, the element two is not in the ideal. And we consider this element two because we are considering two T subtractive sets. Okay, so, and then suppose we have a two T subtractive set C, which is of size greater, strictly greater than M plus one. Then again, uh, using a similar trick, by the pigeonhole principle, we can say that there must exist two distinct elements, C0 and C1 of C, that belong to the same coset of I, and therefore their difference must live in the, the ideal I. But then we assume that C is 2T subtractive, and therefore the difference between C0 and C1 must divide 2, which implies that 2 is in the ideal, which is a contradiction. Okay, so. This is, uh, right. Uh, so I hope these, these uh, special cases uh, give you a feeling of uh, what the general results in the paper look like. And so finally, let me uh, summarize my talk. So in this talk I, or in this work, we have formalized uh, the notion of ST subjective sets. We have applied this notion to Schnorr-like arguments and threshold secret sharing over some ring R. And we construct polynomial size ST subjective sets uh, with almost matching impossibility results over cyclotomic rings. And if we plug in these uh, ST subjective sets into existing bulletproof, uh, lattice bulletproof, we, we get better uh, lattice bulletproof, uh, better in terms of parameters. And finally, we also show that it is impossible to do much better in terms of slack and uh, knowledge error with these Schnorr-like arguments. So for more, for the full detail about all the results, I encourage you to check out this paper, which is on ePrint. And if you find it a bit too overwhelming, you can also check this blog post here. Okay, so thank you for your attention and I, can, I welcome any questions. Thank you very much, Russell. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Mm. Yeah, let, let me start with a question. Uh, do you have impossibility results when S is not very small? Let's say instead of having being two, what if it, like let's say if S is 128 or something, or I mean, it's still yeah. some constant, yeah, but we, it's a we, relatively we, large constant, let's say. We, we, have, a, we have very general uh, impossibility results, which says that um, uh, if you have, so, so usually they, they, they are of the following form. So it, you cannot have a ST subtractive set of a certain size, uh, with mm -hmm. S not being in a certain ideal. So, so if, mm -hmm. if my ring R uh, contains a certain ideal with a certain number of cosets, and then uh, you cannot have an ST subtractive set with a certain size, which is related to this uh, number of cosets. 
And so you can plug in different uh, rings, ideals, and S to, to get your desired uh, impossibility. Mm -hmm. Do you, well, like kind of like a follow up, do you, can you construct a larger set, which is not, which is larger than M over two plus one, but still has a constant slack, kind of like, or let's say a known slack, which is like an integer or some fixed known ring element. Uh, yeah, I think for, like a very boring example is that uh, you consider four instead of two. Ah, okay. So uh, slack, slack four instead of two, and uh, then you can double your size. Um, uh -huh, okay. So you, you can have a size a set of size m plus one instead of m over two plus one. So I, I yeah I think you, you can see the pattern here. So you can yeah yeah. yeah I, see. Uh, I think uh, Vanessa, um, do you want to? Uh, all right, go ahead, Mama. Uh, Vanessa, do you want to ask your question? Oh, sure. Hello. Uh, hi, Russell. Thank you for uh, a great talk with a very, I appreciate the very clear explanations. I, I just had some naive questions about zero knowledge. So you said that you uh, specifically were only going to talk about soundness and completeness, but I just wanted right. to ask, because of course, in the um, ordinary prime field setting, the Schnorr proofs are not known to be zero knowledge. So I just wanted to ask the obvious question about the, um, proofs that you are discussing? Are they zero knowledge? Are they honest verifier zero knowledge? Um, so, um, okay, I have a lot of slides to uh, go back. So, um, this protocol, I think you can add some modifications to it. So like, uh, you can perform rejection sampling uh, in, in uh, when you compute this x hat, at least in the non-interactive setting. And, and then it can achieve uh, honest verifier zero knowledge, if I remember correctly. And, and then for the second protocol here, it is not zero knowledge at all. So uh, you can definitely derive information about uh, the witness x, but that's not the point because usually uh, you use this bulletproof protocol as an inner protocol uh, of, of, a, of a bigger protocol. So you first deal with the zero knowledge part. So you reduce the, the relation that you want to prove into another relation where you don't mind leaking the witness at all. And then you use this uh, bulletproof protocol for proving this inner relation. And there you don't need zero knowledge. Ha, huh, thank you. All right, maybe I ask my question. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, so there was a slide uh, in which you explained the relation with, with the uh, secret sharing. Can you bring it That's up? Right. Um, I think you just it's asked. Here. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, but you didn't use it uh, in the sequence. Was it just to, to show that there is such a concept? Or, or relation between these um, subtractive sets and secret sharing, or you use them later and I missed it. Uh, so I didn't. I didn't use it uh, in this talk, and mm -hmm. in the paper, you uh, we also didn't use it in the main matter. But uh, we we show we showed an example in uh, appendix. I think appendix A that you can, for example, build a distributed PR. So, and the construction is exactly like um, the distributed PRF that was constructed by Bonnet et al, I think, uh, in 2013. And, but this is just a generalization of their construction. So, so uh, in a sense, you can view their construction as uh, using a particular ST subtractive set, which is like, in my opinion, horrible. And then uh, we show that you can plug in like better ST subtractive sets instead and get uh, slightly better uh, constructions. But uh, I, must, I must say that these improvements, they are not super nice and therefore we didn't put it into the main method. I see, thank you. When you say not super nice, is it like a, 
it brings other complications or it no, doesn't they, make like much they, 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 they make, um, so, so they achieve better parameters, but not so much better. So like, uh, there is no like exponential improvement, right? Yeah. So in terms of practice, do you know how much of an improvement roughly? Mm. I forgot what the conclusion was. I think at some point we say that, okay, the Bonet scheme uh, support only constant number of parties and we can support uh, a, a polynomial number of parties. But I'm not sure if this conclusion still holds. <laughs> Okay. So this might be the conclusion, but I, I forgot. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. Um, any last questions, anyone? Um, can I ask also? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Ron. Hi, Raphael. Thank you for the talk. I was wondering also about the secret sharing application. I, what is the uh, comp consequence of the slack in this case? I mean, does it mean that you don't recover the actual secret? But you recover yeah, exactly, multiple. exactly. Yeah. So, okay. yeah, I, it's a bit difficult to explain the secret sharing thing because the secret sharing itself. Uh, so, so if so, for, for example, you can consider um, uh, R mod Q instead of R, and then you make that a field or very close to a field, and then you can just perform standard Shami secret sharing there. If you if what you want is just a secret sharing. So the complication is that uh, uh, you is when you uh, try to use this secret sharing uh, in addition to to some other homomorphic primitives. So in the case of distributed PRF, you have a key homomorphic PRF and the secret sharing, and when you combine them, you get a distributed PRF. And and the the complication lies in uh, the key homomorphic primitive because the usually lattice space key homomorphic things they are not exact right so they are all only almost key homomorphic and then when you apply this uh, linear function uh, that is defined in this key homomorphic primitive uh, on the on the secrets then then you get uh, some noise and and therefore uh, and and then Right, and so so after some routine calculation, you you notice that this S plays a role in uh, in the secret that you can recover. So uh, so in the case of distributed PRF, you actually recover uh, not the original PRF value, but uh, I think S times the original uh, PRF value. And and so and so this means uh, so far we only see applications of this ST subtractive set. Uh, in applications where you actually don't care about the exact value of the the recovered secret, so you are happy if uh, you can recover something unique, and and if that's the case, this is a good notion for you. Otherwise, you can use a subtractive set which uh, uh, have have no slack, and that works as well. I see. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think we might take one more question if anyone has any. Any last questions? Okay. It seems not. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Russell, for your very interesting talk. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. I uh, hope to see everyone in the next seminar. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.